May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. October 8th, 2016. Does anybody remember what happened to Hilton Head that day? Hurricane Matthew. Yes. 88 mile per hour winds, 14 inches of rain, 120,000 trees down, substantial flooding, $51 million in repair and reconstruction. How many of you were impacted by that and remember it? Yes. I, uh, I know that Hurricane Matthew is one of the reasons that we actually have the glorious Kranz Fellowship Hall also. So that's a good thing that came out of it. These kind of events, though, they make us feel pretty out of control, don't they? One of the reasons storms are so deadly is because water is so deadly. Water is powerful, unpredictable, and destructive when it escapes its natural boundaries. And for ancient people, even more than for us today, water was deadly. I don't know if you know this, but you can't breathe underwater. For ancient people, water carried with it ideas of chaos and death. So here's what we're going to do today in three sections. First, we're going to briefly explore several stories in Scripture where we see God's power over the waters and how he guides his people through the waters. Okay? Secondly, we're going to look at two places in the Gospel of Mark where the waters reveal the identity of Jesus. And then thirdly, we're going to talk about passing through the waters in our own lives and the good news for us today. So to begin, let's take our survey of some key places in Scripture where we see God's power over the waters and how he guides his people through the waters. And the very first reference is Genesis 1. That is on page 1 of your pew Bible, if you are so inclined. The reason we can do this is because the Bible is a unified story, and there are repeated patterns in Scripture, okay? Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, which are the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Okay, so what's happening on the first page of the Bible? Before God gave the earth its shape, it was wild and waste, without form, without shape. It was void and empty. There was water, but the water was chaos and darkness, like a giant storm covering the whole earth. And this chaos and this darkness was not safe for humans. So God had to make a place for them so that they might live safely between the waters. God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And he, God saw that it was good. So here we have a theme. This is a pattern. This is order out of chaos. We have the chaos of pre-creation and the water being separated and driven back so that a safe place for humans could appear, right? And we're going to see this pattern repeated. We also have a boundary marked from a time when humans could not survive to a time when new life on earth could exist. So in short, here we have God creating order out of chaos, creating a safe place for humans so that new life can flourish, okay? Now, let's fast forward a few chapters to Genesis 6, and we come to a man named Noah. And here the narrator tells us in Genesis 6, 11, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Okay, so God is telling Noah that the good creation that he created had been corrupted, meaning that what was order has now become chaos again. The earth had become uncreation again, 
And so God gives Noah instructions to build a huge boat, like an, an, an ark. Then he says to Noah, For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. Why? Because humanity has chosen away from, chosen to turn away from God and has begun to destroy themselves and destroy the earth along with them. Humanity chose corruption instead of God, and so God is giving them what, the, what they're asking for, okay? So God brings a reversal of creation, a flood, where life ends. But in the midst of the chaos, Noah's family passes through the waters unharmed, bringing new life into the world. This is our second event. First was creation. Second is the flood. Next comes the story of the exodus out of Egypt. Let's just look at our psalm today, and you can, we're going to look at verses 1, 3, and 5. When Israel came out of Egypt and the house of Jacob from among a people of a foreign tongue, the sea beheld it and fled. Jordan was driven back. What ailed you, O sea, that you fled? O Jordan, that you were driven back? So here we actually see in Psalm 114 a combination of two events. The crossing of the Red Sea coming out of Egypt, and then also the crossing of the Jordan with Joshua as they passed through the wilderness into the Promised Land in Joshua 3. I want us to take note that both of these events come when Israel is reaching a border or a transition. They're leaving behind a way of death with Egypt and slavery, with wilderness and the death of the unbelieving generation, and they're entering through the waters of the Red Sea and the Jordan into the new life of the Promised Land. That was our third event, Israel passing through the Red Sea and the Jordan. Next, let's look at our bulletins in the Old Testament passage today in 2 Kings. Here we have another kind of boundary and transition. The end of Elijah's ministry and the beginning of Elisha's, right? So here again, we have a water crossing. First, we have verse 8, where Elijah takes off his own cloak and strikes the river, and the river Jordan parts like it did before with Joshua. And the two of them pass through the water safely on dry ground. Then, a few sentences later, in verse 14, Elisha has taken up the mantle, and he strikes the Jordan again, and he crosses over. And then, on the other side of this water, we see the prophets. And these prophets are demonstrating a new understanding. They say the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they come to meet him and bow down to the ground before him. Okay? The prophets here see a transition. They see that it has been made from Elijah to Elisha. Okay, so is a picture starting to congeal in our minds? Do you see the patterns? This kind of passing through the water means change. It is a flashing neon sign that says old life to new life. Maybe it's old life to new life. I don't know. And this pattern is a repetition of the same story over and over to show us that this kind of chain, change marks people. Who are they? Well, they're through the water people. To round this section out, I'm just going to give you one reference out of dozens of poetic references in the Psalms and the Prophets about chaotic waters and the Lord subduing the chaos. This is Psalm 89. O Lord, God of hosts, who is mighty, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you, you rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You crushed Rahab like a carcass. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. Who or what is Rahab? This is an ancient Mesopotamian multi-headed sea dragon of chaos. Just like Leviathan, really. It was basically a demon, a god from another country. 
So what then does this and other references to chaos demons add to the mix? Well, it means our God is king over heaven and earth and king over under the earth also. And he subdues and he defeats all demonic forces. For ancient people, a huge storm over the water like a hurricane represents death and destruction for good reason. But scripture tells us that God rules the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, he stills them. So, okay, to summarize, we just looked at creation, Noah, the Exodus, Elijah and Elisha, and Psalm 114. That was a lot. They told us that God rules over the waters of chaos and evil and death, and God guides his people through them in safety. Okay? Now, let's transition and move to our second part. We're going to look at the Gospel of Mark, where the water reveals Jesus' identity. We're going to Mark 1, verse 9. It says, In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And the voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Okay, you're thinking like a Hebrew now, right? You have all of these references to water in the Old Testament swimming around in your mind. Come on, that was punny. (laughs) You're supposed to laugh. Okay. Here we have the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as Mark says. And this is the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. This event takes place at a boundary and a transition. So what elements from our Rolodex of past events can we already map onto Jesus' baptism? Well, for one, we have the Spirit of God hovering over the waters of chaos, like Genesis 1, and Jesus then becoming an ark that saves Noah and his family. We have Jesus passing through the waters like Exodus, like the people of God through the Red Sea. And in the Exodus, the Spirit of God blows the water into two walls on the right and the left, which is like the Spirit splitting the sky open and coming down upon Jesus. Then we have our second King's reading today with a transition from Elijah to Elisha. We have the beginning of Elisha's ministry marked by a crossing of the Jordan River where Jesus is now beginning his ministry. Okay, not only all of those things, but when Jesus enters into the waters of the Jordan, the story of creation is replayed. Jesus conquers the sea dragons, the chaos dragons, Rahab and Leviathan, and new life comes out on the other side. We need to see that in Jesus' story, every other story in Scripture comes to its source. Every story we just went through points to Jesus. And don't forget, we're looking at these stories in Mark so we can understand who Mark is telling us that Jesus is. His hidden uh, identity in Mark is being revealed. Verse 45, Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And so the disciples then head out in the boat. And for several hours, they head toward the middle of the lake, which is about seven miles across at its widest. But the gospel says that the sea became rough, right? The chaotic waters of uncreation and death and destruction are picking up. The wind picks up and was pushing against them, and the waves are getting stronger. So they're rowing against the wind for hours, but they only make it about two to three miles into the middle of the lake, which also means that they're only, they're really two to three miles from every shore on the side. They're surrounded by an intense storm. Okay, now I know Father J.D. has been doing some boating, and obviously he's a legit sailor now. 
You can tell him I said that. He'll, he'll see it anyway. <laughs> but I haven't done any boating. So the one time he takes my family out, after a while the sky turns grayish, and it starts to rain very gently. And the waves are no longer like absolutely perfectly still. Uh, though they're really, they're, they're not anything serious. I have to admit in that moment, my lack of experience made me think it was worse than it really was. And I got very little nervous because I'm holding, you know, my two-month-old son. I'm sure all of you water people think I'm hilarious. But like all of you, the disciples are real water people. They spent hours every day on the water. It was their work. And they were very afraid. This storm came up on them suddenly, and I bet they were hoping they could beat it. They really didn't have a choice. Let's look at verse 47. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and Jesus was alone on the land, and he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, between 3 and 6 a.m., he came to them, walking on the sea. These men, these 12 men, have been doing their P90X rowing exercises for 9, 10, and 11 hours straight. They're just trying to stay alive. And finally, in the hours just before dawn, Jesus sees them struggling, and he comes down the mountain toward them. And look, from here out in the story, we're going to see some really shocking things. I don't want us to brush past them. Mark tells us that Jesus came to them and he was walking on the water. Don't let our familiarity with this story let us move past that too quickly. Who in the world walks on water? When Mark uses that phrase, walking on the water, the same Greek phrase is found somewhere in the Greek version of the Old Testament. It's found in the book of Job, chapter 9, verse 8. It says this, God alone stretched out the heavens and walks on the waves of the sea as dry ground. Who alone walks on the waves of the sea? God alone. You see, the whole Bible is about Jesus. When Jesus walks on the water, he does that on purpose. He's telling us who he is. I like to call connections like that, like with Job, hyperlinks. They're like hyperlinks in the story. You click them and you go to the other one, right? And that was just the first clue. We're going to keep reading in verse 48. He meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Okay, he meant to pass by them. Doesn't that sound weird? But it's actually not weird if we remember Exodus 33 and 34 and the story of Moses. Do we remember how Moses asked to see God's glory? God told him he couldn't see him and live, but that he could put him in a cleft of the rock and pass by him. And as he passed by him, he would declare his name to Moses, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious. This then is another intentional reference to Jesus' true identity. It is a hyperlink to Exodus 33. But here, Jesus doesn't pass by. He comes to them and declares his name. What does Jesus say? Our translation here is trying to be kind of conversational. It says, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. But we need to remember that G G we had just had the story of Moses in our minds. And so it is I is actually not the best. Because what Jesus really says is ego a me. Take heart, I am, do not be afraid. Jesus just said he is the great I am, just like he told Moses in Exodus 3. 
And now Jesus is walking on water. Who alone walks on water? God. And he is talking, he's using the very words of God to identify himself. He declares his name to them just like he did with Moses as he passed, passed by. That's not the end. Verse 51, he got into the boat with them and the wind ceased. The wind ceased. There was immediate calm. This is another proof of Jesus' identity. Psalm 107, 29 says, He made the storm to be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Who's the psalm talking about? Jesus. The Sunday school answer is right. It's Jesus. What is Mark telling us? Jesus is the one who created the seas. He has power over storms. He's the Son of God and the great I Am. Now, let's move to our third and final section. Let's talk about passing through waters in our own lives. And let's see what the good news is for us today. So in order to do that, we're going to talk about two kinds of waters. The waters of adversity and the waters of baptism. What if we right now are passing through waters of adversity, like broken relationships or turbulent marriages or difficult business partnerships or even national unrest and division? What do we do? Well, we need to remember that we are through the water people. We remember the waters of baptism. Paul tells us in Romans 6 that in the waters of baptism, we were co-crucified, co-buried, and co-raised with Christ. That we were knit together with Christ so that we are now part of him. Now our identity is found in Christ and who he is. Our life is hidden in Christ. And if that's true, when we pass through the waters of adversity, who's in the boat with us now? Our Lord is in the boat with us now. Our Lord is sovereign over the storms. He comes to us walking on the water above the chaos, and he is speaking to us, asking us to trust him. And our Lord is also completely aware of every other person in the situation. He knows what they need also, and he's working to bring them to faith also. Jesus asks us to love our brothers and sisters as well as our political enemies, trusting that he then is able to calm every storm in every heart. Now, how do we actively trust him? We listen to him, and we listen to him by getting quiet before him. We read his word. We pray. Five minutes a day or 45 minutes, whatever you are able to do every day. What other kinds of waters would we be passing through right now? Are they health concerns? Are they planning for the future concerns? We know there is one passage through the waters that every human being makes, and that is through death. But again, who are we? We are through the water people. In the waters of baptism, we were already killed, buried, and raised with Christ. We are identified with him, united to him. He is in the boat with us now, and his victory is our victory. Not only that, though, his baptism is our baptism. When he came up out of the water, the Spirit descended, and the Father declared, this is my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. And now for all who pass through the waters of baptism with faith, the Spirit moves over us, and the Father declares the same thing over us. This is my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. Because of that, the waters of death can only separate us for a short time from our loved ones on earth. 
And they carry us then safely into the presence of Jesus Christ. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? You are a toothless and defeated sea monster. Now, because our Lord has already gone before us through the waters of death, taking its sting upon him, himself, we are given safe passage to the other side. All of death's power was extinguished on the cross. It was used up on the one who could rise again by his own power. And now, all that is left for us, all that is left for us is this final word from Isaiah. But now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.